Hi, and welcome to Mastering Your Fertility TV. I'm Dr. Haley Nye. I'm Kristen Cornett. And we are the creators of the online fertility platform, Tiny Feet. And over at Tiny Feet, we help couples in reclaim their health, enhance fertility, and prepare for pregnancy. So in today's episode, we are going to be talking with Dr. Carrie Jones. She is a naturopathic doctor and an expert in women's uh, hormones. And so she works over at Precision. Precision Analytical, and they run a test called the Dutch test, which is dried urine for comprehensive hormones. Yeah, dried urine test for comprehensive Thank hormones. You. And it's it's not testing to see if you're Dutch, <laughs> but it is testing all of your hormones and the metabolites of your hormones. And so this is going to include include testosterone, um, your DHEA. Uh, estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, and then also the downstream effects of that. So it's a really cool test. We actually offer it on our website with a consultation. And so we wanted to help our listeners understand more about what the Dutch test is and why we recommend it and why it's really the only hormone test that we use. Yeah. Practice. So this interview with Dr. Carrie Jones is great. We go over all of the specific markers that are found on the Dutch tests, like Dr. Haley just mentioned. And we talk about how these can actually um, show what might be going on with your fertility. So how all of these markers kind of help us uncover the root cause of maybe some hormone imbalance symptoms that you're having, and then ultimately trouble conceiving. So this is a fantastic test, the one that we use in clinical practice mm -hmm. to kind of get to the root of what's going on with hormones. And it's really different than the conventional blood tests that you might be receiving in your doctor's office. So Dr. Jones goes over some of the differences and why this provides a more complete picture for you and why it's a great option for kind of getting to the root of things, especially when conventional blood tests may not be revealing the answers for you. And we also want to mention a free resource that we've created to help you uncover whether or not hormone imbalances might be affecting your fertility. So we have a free quiz called, Are You Healthy Enough to Get Pregnant? You can access that um, on our website through the URL that you see on your screen. And it's right at the top of the page. You can just click the take the quiz button and you'll get access to that right away. And this goes over five categories of symptoms that may be affecting your ability to conceive. And we also give you some practical tips on how to deal with those and hormone imbalance is one of those categories that we, we can help assess for you with this quiz. So we highly encourage you to download that um, either before or during the episodes. So you can get an idea of whether or not some of this testing can be helpful for you. We hope you enjoy the interview. All right. Well, welcome Dr. Carrie Jones. Thank you so much for being on the Mastering for Your Fertility podcast today. We are so excited to have you on. Thanks ladies. Yeah, this is going to be cool. Yeah. Um, so we first want to know a little bit how you got into this profession and why you fell in love with hormones. <laughs> so I've always, since I was a little kid, I've always known that I wanted to be in women's health and um, I wanted to be a doctor. And when I found naturopathic medicine, I just continued that whole path of women's health hormones. That's what I did all my studying with. I, my mentor was a big, you know, women's health expert. I did my residency in women's health and hormones and subsequently just kept it going because I found it incredibly fascinating. One being a woman, um, it, I found it really empowering for me and my health. And then two, because I was learning all this amazing information, it was really nice that I could take complex subjects and then break it down for my patients to say like, this is what's going on with you. This is what I suspect. Here's the why behind it. That's always been really important to me. If you can tell women the why, then they're often, they're more, they're usually more on board or they're more motivated to change or they're more motivated to be like, okay, like let's, let's get this worked on. And so, um, yeah, I, I always joke all the time. Like if you've got a kid question, like I'm not your girl. <laughs> if you hurt your knee, like don't come to me. If you've got back pain, like I'm not it. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. I feel like but, I'm getting to that point myself. As well. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a hormonal mess, I got you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. So, um, now when did you graduate again? Was it? Uh, 2005. Yeah. 2005. Wow. So I've been out for a while. Okay. And then you came across a uh, Dutch laboratory or precision analytical, right? Sort of. Yeah. So I knew, I knew the owner, he was the um, lab director of a different clinic, a different hormone clinic for years. And so I've been following his work through that. 
I knew him, but he didn't know me. So it was a weird stalker situation. And so <laughs> we understand that, right? <laughs> so I was, I was the medical director of this large integrative clinic in Portland. So we had MDs and NDs and nurse practitioners and physicians assistants. And he approached the clinic and said, can I do a presentation for you guys about this new dried urine hormone test I'm doing? And I said, oh, Mark Newman, I know you. So he came and presented and it was amazing. And I thought, I said, yeah, we'll totally incorporate the test. Um, we do a lot of hormones. It'd be great. A lot of cortisol. Uh, and then I emailed him after the fact and I said, hey, um, again, you don't know me, but I know you. And you seem like you need a lot of help. Do you need any help? And he said, yeah, but I can't pay you. <laughs> and so everybody's like, yeah, I need a lot. Of, I need a lot of technical help. I need a lot of sort of doctory help. Um, I was looking to expand and I'd never worked for a lab before. I thought it'd be great to learn from the ground up since it was a startup. That was in 2012. And uh, the rest is history. So I just sort of progressed into, um, well, now I'm paid. <laughs> and um, oh, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good yeah, change. Now I'm paid. And so we have, there's seven doctors, seven naturopathic doctors that work for the clinic now. And um, I'm their medical director. So it's a really amazing experience. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so amazing. Mm -hmm. Now back in 2012, I mean, even now I would say is this dried urine testing is still pretty cutting edge. And so yes. now urine testing has been around since the dawn day, right? Like mm -hmm. urine is what it's, only, it's kind of what we all had other than in blood, but that's, we have so much research on urine testing, but 24 hour urine is what everybody did where you collected urine in like this big <laughs> jug you literally right had to carry around all day long and keep in your fridge which was gross and nobody wanted to do it and if you forgot and accidentally you know just went to the bathroom and didn't collect it you sometimes had to start oh, over yeah. and so along comes dried urine where it's the same it's a similar concept but you just urinate on these like pieces of filter paper it's kind of like taking four pregnancy tests in the day that's what I tell women I'm like you just pee on a stick in the morning you pee on a stick two hours later you pee on the stick at dinner and you pee on a stick before bed and they're like I can do that I'm like I know <laughs> it's it's easy <laughs> it's honestly it's easier than like stool testing and yeah. <laughs> that's gross in my Easily. opinion yeah having done this test a couple oh, yeah. of times myself so yeah <laughs> yep for sure so yeah and that's 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 the Dutch test which and Dutch is an acronym which is we don't we don't test for dry, uh, uh, Dutch heritage. We test for stride urine test for comprehensive hormones. I wonder how many times you have to explain that to people. <laughs> a lot in the beginning, especially when I lecture in Europe. When I lecture in Europe, they're like, Dutch? What is this? I know. They're like, or, yeah, especially like some of the Scandinavian countries or, you know, Netherlands. They're like, I know I'm Dutch. I'm like, no, no, no. It's hormones. <laughs> it's hormones. So what's the acronym? Dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. Perfect. D-U-T-C-H. And then mm -hmm. the lab is precision analytical. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Great. So tell us a little bit more about like, what's the difference between dried urine testing and specifically what Dutch is doing mm -hmm. in um, comparison to what like conventional hormone testing does? Totally. So let's say you're trying to get pregnant. So you go to the doctor and they run a estrogen, which usually an estradiol and a progesterone is part of your workup. There's other stuff. And they'll say, oh, your estradiol is this and your progesterone is this in, you know, like quote, you're normal, you're normal, you're fine, you know, good luck, go try. With the Dutch test, we look at all the hormones you're used to. So like estradiol, progesterone, plus testosterone, DHEA. But what's really cool is that we also look at what are known as metabolites or the pathways. So you're a woman and you make estrogen, but where does it go? So I can tell you where on your detoxification pathway your estrogen goes because some of the pathways are considered um, less carcinogenic, less cancer risk than others. Some of the pathways cause what we call proliferation. So women who get heavy periods, clotty periods, um, large breasts around their, their period, it can be from too much estrogen or it can be that you're going down the pathway that causes proliferation. With testosterone and DHEA, for those women who have PCOS, or PCOS-like symptoms, I can tell you if you're going down the pathway that makes those symptoms worse. Acne, hair thinning, anger and irritation, things like that. Hair growth in places us women don't want, like on our chin and our upper lip, around our nipples. Um, and so it's called the five alpha pathway. And on the Dutch test, I can tell you, yep, your testosterone is going down that pathway, which is really nice to know because what happens is women might come in and say, I have testosterone, or excuse me, I have high testosterone symptoms, but my blood test showed my testosterone is normal. What does that mean? And I'll say, well, you have normal levels. It's just they've, it's choosing the pathway that causes the most symptoms. So let's get you on the other pathway. 
So it gives you a lot more information when you pee on these little pieces of filter paper. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I know at the very end of kind of the estrogen pathway, you also go through um, like how it's actually being, being broken down by like the COMT mm -hmm. um, enzyme yeah. and um, how well like you're methylating and basically getting rid of it out of your exactly. body. Exactly. No, we're not a SNP company, so we're not actually measuring COMT, but we do um, give you sort of a, like an inside look as to how well your COMT might be working. Because women will say to me all the time, oh, I have, um, you know, I'm a double comped. That means I'm slow. I have, my COMT yeah. is slow. And I'll look at their estrogen and I'm like, well, actually, it's not manifesting for you. It might be slow on your SNP test. But on the Dutch test, you actually methylate just fine. So your other, you have other things going on that's saving, saving you, and it's not a problem. And I have other women that say, oh, I don't have a COMT issue. That's not my problem. And I'll look on the Dutch test. I'm like, well, you're not methylating. No, obviously, methylation encompasses lots of SNPs and lots of cofactors, lots of you know, vitamins. Um, but I, might, I can say to her, um, you know what, though? Your estrogen is slow to methylate. So something is wrong in your methylation cycle. Something is wrong in that homocysteine to methionine type of cycle, and it's affecting your estrogen. The other really cool thing about the Dutch test is we look at two organic acids. One is an organic acid for dopamine, which is one of your, of course, neurotransmitters. And the other is an organic acid for norepinephrine and epinephrine. Those two are also broken down partially by COMT. So I look at those in comparison to estrogen. If everything looks bad, then I know it's a slow COMT and everything looks normal, then I'm like, I don't think you have a problem. I don't think COMT is your issue, which is really great for people to know who get sort of stuck or concerned or worried about their SNP results, right? Right, exactly. And yeah, we've tried to explain like, okay, you have these particular uh, genetic variations, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're expressing them. And so that's exactly. what the Dutch test can do. And so actually on our site, we offer the Dutch in, um, in combination with a, um, a genetic testing mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So you can get both pictures, right? So yeah. you're not just seeing what your SNPs are, but you're also seeing, okay, what's actually really happening in your body. Exactly. And just like I was saying, um, that I'm sure you, you guys talk about like COMT is the big player for estrogen. COMT is what methylates estrogen, but it takes a village <laughs> to get there, right? It takes a yeah. village to make COMT. So what will happen is women say, oh, I've tested my COMT. It's normal. I'm like, yeah, but what about everything else on the cycle? So you may have normal COMT, but you may have MTHFR or MTR, MTRR, or, you know, some of these other CBS and it's affecting the way that cycle goes round and round. Right. By the time it gets to COMT, yep. what's happening. Yep. Exactly. Yep. So in our, so with the Dutch test that we offer, it's the Dutch complete. Mm -hmm. And so that also, um, will test for cortisol curve. Can you explain yes. a little bit about that? And yeah, absolutely. That cool. But it's super cool. So um, the Dutch complete is our all urine test and people are usually used to cortisol out of saliva that they'll like, oh, I've done saliva testing and, and for cortisol. But what's great with urine is yes, you get, you get your free cortisol just like you're used to maybe in a saliva test, but then you get cortisone, which is inactive. So some women have low cortisol, not because they can't make it, but because it's all getting deactivated to cortisone. And then I can show you because the treatment is different. What, what, you can't make it or you deactivate it. It's two different things. And then the other thing the Dutch test does is looks to see it's something called metabolized cortisol, which is kind of a new concept. And metabolized cortisol in research, um, they say it gives you about like, an, like a 70 to 80% indication of what your total cortisol production is. So it kind of gives you an idea. Can you even make it in the first place? Or are you making heaps of it, like loads and loads of cortisol? And then, and then that'll tell you some different things. So for example, if your metabolized cortisol is really high, then you have to figure out what's driving up production. What is causing the gas pedal to be pushed on the adrenals to make so much cortisol? And then on the flip side, if it's really low, you want to find out like, why are you not making that much cortisol? Why is the adrenal gland not getting the message to make it? Or why is the liver not metabolizing it that quickly? What's slowing down those liver enzymes? And it's, and it's, it's two different categories. And so it's really nice to pinpoint for women. I can say, oh, 
like over here maybe looks like a thyroid problem and over here might be maybe looks like a glucose insulin issue and they're they're different they're related right they can overlap but they could right it's two different treatment plans when i'm looking at it right so tell us why our cortisol levels are important why is it important to make sure that we're not like way overproducing or way underproducing mm-hmm. cortisol why does that specifically impact women's health and fertility Totally. And cortisol, much like estrogen, gets such a bad rap. Everyone freaks out about cortisol. Oh, cortisol causes belly fat. Oh, cortisol has to do with stress. But it's like Goldilocks, right? We need not too little and not too much. We need just right. And it depends on the time of day. (laughs) So your cortisol goes up in the morning and that that spike in the morning, it's like like a mountain and then it comes down through the rest of the day so you can fall asleep at night. But that spike in the morning does a couple things. One is it lowers your inflammation. So it suppresses inflammatory cytokines. Two, it helps with the fact that you've just woken up fasting. So you don't, it'll help uh, stimulate your body to make a little more glucose to, um, you know, make, you haven't eaten breakfast yet. You just woke up, you just got out of bed. So you don't feel terrible because you, because you're fasting. Um, Three, um, it greatly affects your autoimmune. So um, there's something called glucocorticoid induced apoptosis of the thymus cells. So what that super fancy word for your thymus gland, uh, not thyroid, but thymus is responsible for taking your immune cells and double checking them to make sure they're not autoimmune before they get sent out. And so if you have a, a naughty little immune cell that's accidentally been created autoimmune, your body goes, oh, ooh, yeah, you're bad. Let's kill you. And the stimulation of getting killed is that spike in cortisol. So what will happen in women is that they don't get the spike in cortisol. It goes down or it's flat. In there, and you know, they're like, I'm tired in the morning. I need so much caffeine. I have to hit the alarm a hundred times or snooze a hundred times. But when you don't get that spike, you don't get the killing. And those little autoimmune cells, when my head, they sneak out. <laughs> That's the analogy uh-huh. I have. They like slip out of the house. And now you have circulating autoimmune cells that should not be out there. And so um, it, women will say, my autoimmune symptoms are worse in the morning, or I've had a lot of stress lately, I've been really tired, and I'm feeling more autoimmune, like especially women who have Hashimoto's or you know, type 1 diabetes or some of these other factors. Exactly. And how many women have these autoimmune conditions and are struggling to get pregnant? So many of them. So if we can restore that spike in the morning, it'll help your blood sugar balance. It'll help your inflammation and it will help um, your autoimmune stuff. Ooh, so it I does a lot. That. Yeah. That's so interesting. That's actually something that I, I didn't really think I, about. I didn't know about the thymus thing. That's, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. I didn't know. About I actually that. learned it. Um, I'm sure I learned it in school and I, you know, at the time <laughs> <Me too. laughs> I was like overwhelmed didn't you know, whatever. And then I learned it again from, um, it was an autoimmune summit two, two or three years ago. And, uh, Dr. Heather's wiki. Oh, um, yeah. yep. So <laughs> she said it in, in, when she was giving the lecture and she is my hero. I adore Dr.'s wiki. And I was like, Oh, that is the coolest fact I've ever learned in my whole life. So I did all the <laughs> I printed every article about it so I could study it. And sure enough, it's, it's technically, it's the cortisol awakening response is your spike in, in cortisol. That is really cool. And sure I enough. guess it makes a lot of sense that, um, you know, an increase in stress or eventual like fatigue, right? Adrenal mm-hmm. fatigue leads yeah. to autoimmune conditions. Right. It so can do that, but now it's like, oh, we have the mechanism of action behind it now. One of them. Yep. Definitely one of them. Yep. When you get a so, flat, flat line. Yeah. And so for our know. listeners, Heather's wiki, Dr. Heather's wiki is our immune professor. She teaches, um, immunology, immunology at mm-hmm. NUNM, which is the school that we graduated mm-hmm. from. So yeah, she's yep. great. She's brilliant. So she said it and I was like, it's like the greatest factoid I've ever learned. <laughs> I love when those things happen and you're like, I'll I never forget that ever. I'll my never. Whole life. I know. She's like, Carrie, I taught you this in school. I'm like, I know, I'm sure you did. <laughs> that was back then. So with our uh with a Dutch test, um, so obviously we focus on fertility. So what specifically in in for fertility, what how can the Dutch help help those? who are struggling. Absolutely. So a couple ways. Um, one, obviously progesterone. So we test progesterone. We know progesterone is your progestation hormone. So I can 
let you know if you're ovulating or not. Um, and one of the things that people I think get wrong around ovulation is they think you either do or you don't. And actually the question is, do you ovulate one and do you ovulate, but do you have strong enough lutein cells? So your corpus luteum, right, is what makes progesterone. Uh -huh. So you can absolutely release an egg and ovulate, but those, that, those leftover cells that are, there's, whose responsibility is to make progesterone might be of bad quality and, or lazy, or like they don't want to do it. And so they kind of like eke out progesterone, but not very well. And so people will look at lab work generically and they'll say, oh, your progesterone's low, you don't ovulate. When really, she might, she, we just need to strengthen the lutein cells, which are, is a little different. Getting you to ovulate and getting stronger cells are two different things. So at least on the Dutch, I can look and say, it looks like you ovulated, but your cells are pretty weak. Or I can say, nope, you didn't ovulate, your progesterone's near zero. <laughs> yeah, do you use um, a specific number or cutoff on the Dutch test for that? Yeah, so um, on the Dutch test, when you're looking at it um, on the progesterone levels, it's, we, have, we have dials. And so they're, the dials are red like a gas gauge. So there's an upper and lower limit star. And then we have the menopausal range as well. So all the dials look the same. And we always give the menopausal range for women. So you know, no matter what age you are, where you fall in the continuum. Are you in menopausal range, even if you're not menopausal? Or are you in sort of the range you're supposed to be for a cycling woman? So on the Dutch test, if you're in between the stars, it tells me that you ovulated and you're making progesterone. And if you're in the gray area, in between the star and the menopausal range, that tells me you ovulated, but your lutein cells are pretty weak. If you're in the menopausal range, then it tells me you likely did not ovulate um, because you're, you, you do all month long, you, you, know, you have the ability, even in the follicular phase, uh, you do eke out a little bit of progesterone, but obviously it should go up significantly after ovulation. Right. So I have three areas that I look at to determine if you've, um, one, ovulated, and two, the strength of your cells. Um, so if it's between the stars, you're saying that we know that they ovulated mm -hmm. and their luteal cells are doing a decent job. Decent. And, and again, it depends. Where... It, exactly. Yeah, okay. yep. So even in between the stars, which is considered quote normal, if you're at the high end of the star, then you're really robust. Good for you. But if you're down at the other star, so you're in range, but not like great, then I know that it probably, again, it's those cells you're probably, you're making it, but you're probably not going to sustain making it which is gonna increase your risk for miscarriage. And of course we don't in the, in the early weeks and we're trying to avoid that. So if I see that and somebody who's trying to get pregnant, then I'm used in, a, especially if they are pregnant, um, I put them on progesterone or if they're not actively trying to get pregnant, I'm just trying to strengthen the cells. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's give it a good three months at least to try to strengthen the, these lutein cells. And what's interesting is lutein cells, um, your corpus luteum, they're high in carotenoids. So I tell people to eat things that are high in carotene, right? Eat your red and your orange and even some of your green family. Um, and that can be really, really helpful. And then anything that supports cells in general, like your good healthy oils um, to help the cell wall, you know, your phospholipids um, make yeah. give yourself a healthy, a healthy cell. Yeah, we actually have a, um, by uh, Ben Lynch's Seeking Health brand, mm -hmm. has a phospholipid complex. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really nice. It's yeah. a good PC. Oh, yeah, of course. So that could be yeah. really helpful for, very much so. for the luteal cells too. And then the carotenoids, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, especially because that corpus luteum is more yellow, right? So. It's from the carotenoids. Yeah, They're, it's colored yeah. from the carotenoids. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So, so that's then, a fun thing <laughs> that I look for yeah. in the Dutch test. Well, it also matters like where that progesterone is in relationship to where your estrogen is too, right? There's a relativity factor there. Too. It is most definitely. And on the Dutch test, people will often ask, what's the like progesterone to estrogen ratio? Because um, a lot of people will do that in saliva or serum. Um, but the difference is on the Dutch test, because we give all the detox pathways too, you actually have to compare your progesterone to each layer of estrogen because you may not be estrogen dominant with your estradiol, your E1 and your E2, but you may be estrogen dominant compared to your phase one detoxification because those dials are very reactive. They're reactive oxygen species when they become that, and that's very inflammatory. Um, or like, it, like in comparison earlier, I talked about the proliferative one. So the proliferative pathway is what's called the 16 pathway. Mm -hmm. So if you have a whole lot of 16, if that's the pathway you prefer, 
again, you're the woman who's like, I have terrible heavy periods and I have big tender breasts. And so your actual estrogen might be fine, but you go down this, this proliferative path, this growing pathway. And so now in comparison to progesterone, your estrogen dominant. And the same goes for the next level down, we're looking at methylation, because if you don't methylate it, if you can't neutralize your estrogen to get it out into your urine and into your bile, then your estrogen dominant that layer too. They, they're just going to recirculate round and round they go. So yeah. three different layers. So that's a really good point. And I think that brings up another question. Let's take our listeners back just a little bit and tell us what the different types of estrogen are that we produce that we mm -hmm. care about in this context and then the pathways that we break them down through. Yeah, absolutely. So we have three main estrogens. Well, we, so we have three estrogens, I should say two main estrogens in the body. So we have E1, which is estrone and E2, which is estradiol. And that's usually what everybody checks in blood work or on saliva. And then we also have E3, which is estriol. And estriol is what goes up the highest when you're pregnant, but it's really important for other things too. Um, it's like, like vaginal health. It's what keeps us from having vaginal dryness. So it's a good one. And then your E1 and your E2 go through phase one detoxification. You have three pathways you can choose from. You can, you can go down the two pathway, you can go down the four pathway, and you can go down the 16 pathway. So like I said, the 16 pathway is the one that's more the, the growing one. So I say all the time, good for bones, bad for boobs. <laughs> so, so right, big heavy, big heavy breasts, or if you have breast cancer, it will stimulate breast cancer to grow, but it also is supportive for bone health. So um, again, the Goldilocks analogy, we need some for our bones, but not so much that we get heavy periods. The four pathway, if it does not get neutralized, if it does not go through methylation, can continue on and that can um, increase the risk for DNA damage. And if we have DNA damage, that increases the risk for breast cancer or estrogen type cancers. And then the two pathway is what we call less carcinogenic. So um, some people call it healthier. It's not necessarily healthier. It can still increase your risk for cancer. It's just not as, not as much, not as greatly. And then, and, then, and then those pathways continue on and they go through COMPT, C-O-M-T, which we were talking about earlier, methylation, because basically your two and your four need to get neutralized. Um, and so they go, COMPT is what does that. And now they're neutral and then they get pushed out of the cell and then into your urine or into your bile and into your intestines. So it's this very complica complex, complicated <laughs> estrogen detox. But how it relates to, you know, as women are, you know, women are listening to this, like, well, how does this relate to me? If you've got all the symptoms, if you've got PMS, if you've got heavy periods, fibroids, you grow polyps, um, you know, you've got um, even endometriosis, adenomyosis, these are all very estrogen related. Estrogen can make things grow. And so it's really nice to know where you fall in this detox pathway, because it can really help reduce a lot of your symptoms. And as I said, progesterone is your progestation hormone. So if you don't have enough progesterone, you're going to have a tough time with implantation. You're going to have a tough time um, hanging on to that pregnancy once, 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 you know, implantation has occurred if progesterone drops too low. So it's, so you get all these extra layers that are really cool to see. That you can't get through a serum. Yeah. Test. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So cool. Which is what's so frustrating for women, right? They, they're like, well, I was told I was normal. Everything's normal. I'm like, it might, your, S, your E2, your blood work might be normal, Yeah. but we got to peel back the layer of the onion. Like the next layer might not be normal. The next layer might not be normal. And that's where we get into it and can really make a difference. Yeah. I think that's why, especially in cases of like infertility, it's so important to be doing some of this more functional lab work because you just don't get the information when you have, you know, one snapshot of one mm -hmm. hormone, you don't see the breakdown, you don't get kind of the, the interplay of the genetics and, and that mm -hmm. enzyme there that, that is being used for methylation. So right. what are some of the things that influence these pathways and how well we're able to break down process and detoxify estrogen? Absolutely. So a big one is like your blood sugar and your insulin. So the way that women make estrogen is through aromatization. So right in our ovaries, um, the cells that for women that make testosterone actually um, aromatize. So aromatase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. And um, we often associate that with men, but actually it's, it's the way that women make estradiol and, and estrone. So um, right in the ovary, your, your cells that make testosterone then convert into 
estrogen in different cells, um, but insulin can, can increase that. So if you have, like think of like your PCOS woman, if you have your classic PCOS, if you have excess insulin, then you're going to push on all these cells to make testosterone, which can also push that aromatase to make estrogen. Inflammation. Inflammation will affect your SNPs, the way your, your genes turn on and off and which pathway that you go down. Your diet, various things in your diet, smoking, um, environmental exposure like BPA, uh, BPS, BPF, um, uh, things in the air, they're called PAHs, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, things that you get in like farming, some of the um, fertilizers and stuff will affect these enzymes that detoxify your estrogen. They also will affect that aromatase enzyme and increase estrogen creation. And so it's, it's unfortunately, it's a lot of things that, that affect everything from, from your SNPs, right? To your, your detox pathways, to the way that your cells work um, that then affect your estrogen or and even your progesterone. So really important to be dialing in diet and lifestyle along with this. A hundred percent. It's yeah. not just as simple as, oh, test your hormones and give whichever ones are low yep. and detox yep. whichever ones are high. It's, it's a lot yeah. more complex than that. So like everything Absolutely. we address on in our fertility assessment, right? <laughs> <laughs> all the diet and lifestyle factors. Exactly. I was just going to say, I'm, I know you guys are, you know, when, if somebody has low progesterone, I always, I'm sure you do too. I always get, Oh, should I take progesterone? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> why right. is your progesterone low? Let's find right. out why your progesterone's low, right? Or my estrogen's high. Oh, I'm going to take dim with methane, this one supplement. I'm like, oh, okay, but let's find out why that pathway is, you know, overreacting. Let's find out why you're making so much estrogen because it, otherwise you're just going to be on a, this medication or supplement for a long time. Like, let's go way back to the root cause. Well, cause at that point it's like a band aid. you're not really yes. fixing whatever the root cause is. And so yep. you know, you're dealing with it a little bit differently than you would say, if you were to go to the doctor with heavy periods and all of these estrogen dominance mm -hmm. issues and the doctor just says, go on birth control before you're ready. Right. To conceive. <laughs> now we're trying to conceive and we're like, well, we can't take birth control. So we'll put a different band aid on it and right. just kind of like force the process to happen instead of figuring out what's really going on underneath. And how many of those women were put on the birth control pill or even like the marina or something and way back and now they're ready to conceive and they go off of it and the same problem from way back still exists because it was never addressed. And so exactly, they come in and they're like, well, I still have that, this problem I had 10, 15 years ago, it's, it's back, I still have it. So, but I'm trying to get pregnant, what do I do? Yeah. Or in my case, it's like, amplified times 50 from yeah. what it was before starting birth control. So yeah, I mean, I definitely, definitely had that experience when I came off and I, I know a lot of women are going through that too. So I yeah. really wish that when I had first come off birth control, that I would have had a Dutch test done because <laughs> I, so that was in like 2015, I think like the very beginning of 2015. Mm -hmm. And I struggled for years with just all kinds of things that were happening. I would have really loved to see a comparison between back mm -hmm. then and, you know, the most recent one that I had done, which still isn't perfect because I've been on a long journey, but yeah. It Healing nice takes time, time right? Healing takes time. It does take time. Well, and it takes yeah. less time when you ask the right questions in the first mm -hmm. place. And that's yeah. what we're talking about doing with this test is asking the right questions up front so that you don't have to spend about four or five years, you know, going through that process. Like mm -hmm. I've been doing having doctors tell you that your hormones are totally normal and right. It makes sense because there it's just a snapshot in time, right? Yeah. It's only and and or hormones fluctuate. So throughout whether day. throughout the day, yeah, it's very much they're very rhythmic. Rhythm, rhythm, rhythmic. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Although I like rhythmic. That's better. That's more fun to say. <laughs> I love that word too. Uh, and yeah, but they fluctuate back and forth. And so it's like you don't really, especially progesterone, like you don't know if at the moment you're doing that blood draw, are you catching it when it's low? Or are you catching it mm -hmm. when it's high? Or, you know, yeah. so I've never been a huge fan of doing blood draws for progesterone. I mean, I, I yeah. still do them a lot for my patients because obviously it's the most affordable, but mm -hmm. I always um, suggest doing a Dutch test because I feel like it's going to be much more information than just doing a serum blood draw. And that makes and even, affordable kind of relative. Like, yes, doing right. a Dutch test might be a little bit more expensive. You know, some insurances may not cover it, but you know, the amount of information that you're getting and spending less time, you know, trying things that may not be working, 
it's yeah. yeah. Or running the risk of miscarriage because if right. you have a fertility center that's saying that your progesterone is just fine, you're ovulating, it's great, you yeah. know, and then you yeah. realize that you're 10 weeks pregnant and you end up having a miscarriage and you realize, oh, maybe my progesterone actually wasn't so great. Right. So, or you've had your second miscarriage or your third miscarriage before somebody, God forbid, decides to work you up, which is always my biggest frustration in practice working with women who would come in and, and they would have, they'd be on their second miscarriage, let's say. And they, I would say, well, what, what has your doctor done? And they're like, well, nothing. They told me to wait until my third before I got worked up. I'm like third. <laughs> yeah. Got, are you serious? Like that's so traumatizing. And what if, exactly. obviously there are a million reasons for miscarriage, but what if, what if it's just progesterone? Like what if yeah. that was it? Like how easy is that? And it's very safe and OBGYNs, you know, recommend or prescribe it just like midwives do, just like naturopathic doctors do, just like nurse practitioners do. I mean, it's it's super common. You can take progesterone through your first trimester. Why wait to your third miscarriage to be like, oh, you know what? We should have put you on progesterone. It's horrifying they to me. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, say that to the three babies I just lost. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So at this point, I, we didn't talk about this earlier, but obviously, you know, if we're talking about measuring progesterone, we're doing this test after ovulation. So the yes. ideal time is a pretty similar window to when we would typically measure blood levels of yes. these hormones. So about like, seven days ish yep. after ovulation. ovulation. Yep, yeah. absolutely. And if just like you guys teach, if women don't know, I, def I strongly advise them to either track temperatures or do the LH kits, the ovulation predictor kits. And once they get a positive on that, then they stop doing those and then count forward you know, five, six, seven yeah. days, and then do a Dutch test. Um, or if they're doing blood test, yeah, that's the most, the absolute most accurate route. And so, I'm sure you guys get this too, where women come into you and they say, okay, I had blood work done, you know, and you're like, well, when did you get it done? They're like, I don't know, Tuesday at two o'clock. <laughs> exactly. Like, what day of the cycle is that? They're like, I don't know, my OBGYN just ran it. I'm like, oh. I honestly, I kind of, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but when I first was in my residency, I was just doing a snap, like whatever day of the cycle, just because it was like, Oh, you're in the office. We'll just, you know, we'll run your hormones right now. And then when I got a little smarter, I was like, that's really <laughs> stupid because that just tells me yeah. nothing about yeah. your health. Yeah. Well, no, that's obviously the importance of having like a focus on women's health and making yes. sure that like women are seeing somebody that that's familiar with how these things need to be done. And, you yeah. know, some women are in the preconception period. They're not even necessarily seeing an OBGYN. They're not even mm -hmm. seeing a, a woman's health expert. They're seeing their primary care yeah. physician. And totally. That person yeah. may or may not be the right person to be doing right. that work for them. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, hormones, it, I mean, obviously since we've been talking the last half hour is they're very complicated, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, you need to make sure that you're taking them in the right time of the month. Yeah. And, um, to, to and it depends what you're looking for too, right? Like if you're looking for progesterone, it needs to be after ovulation, but if you're looking for FSH, you're looking at day two or three. And so I know that this would be, this would be really frustrating to a lot of my women who would say, can I just do one let's say blood draw. Can I just do one blood draw or one? And I'm like, no, because your hormones are rhythmic. Yeah. Would you say red rhythmic? <laughs> I don't know. Rhythmic. <laughs> it's my new favorite word today, rhythmic. And so I'd say, no, you actually, you literally have to come in on day two or three and get, get the FSH and estradiol. And then I'll have you do the Dutch test, you know, seven days post ovulation. And, and if they're doing LH, that's before ovulation, trying to catch ovulation. And it gets, it's women are complicated. <laughs> Uh, but it's so, yeah. I mean, yep. it's so, to me, that's just amazing. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's annoying that you have to do all these tests, but it's because we're trying to tap into such an incredibly mm -hmm. complex, yeah. you know, beautiful system yep. that's designed to create and sustain life. Like, um, yep. Just so it's not going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Like growing a bit, you know, it's like, I think it's always funny to me when, um, like my new pregnant women, my new pregnant moms would say, I don't understand why I'm so tired. I'm like, cause you're literally growing a human. <laughs> it's a bit energy intensive. It's, yeah, it's, it takes a lot of energy to grow a human. <laughs> Incredible. I honestly- So it takes I, a yeah, complex cycle. Yeah. Eight weeks of pregnancy. I was so surprised how tired I was. Like mm -hmm. so surprised. Something to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, just take that time and like lay on the couch. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I did have a question about timing of when we, you take the uh, Dutch test. So women that maybe are just getting off birth control or mm -hmm. say PCOS or whatnot, and they don't have a regular cycle, where, right. where would you tell them to do the test? So it depends how irregular their cycle is. So if they, 
if so always try to do the, the ovulation predictor kits first. So if you're just getting off the pill, we generally suggest waiting three periods before trying because uh, trying for the test because usually it takes at least three periods for the brain and the ovaries to reconnect and for the effect of the pill to start to wear off. Now, obviously some women get off the pill and like the connection happens right away. They have no problem, no issue. But as we know with Dr. Jolene Brighton's work in post birth control syndrome, that it can take a year, a year plus for a lot of women. But at least at Dutch test, we say, give it about three months. Don't rush right into the testing because I wanna see if the brain and the ovaries communicate how they start to communicate. Do the LH, the ovulation predictor kits if you can. Some women are just so wildly irregular um, that in that case, honestly, what I say is call the lab. What, or talk to your, talk to your, talk to your, pra talk to your practitioner or call the lab. Because at the lab, we're going to ask you like, when was your last cycle? What, you know, give us some information about your last couple cycles. Tell me, you know, what, are you taking things? So we're going to ask a little bit of background information to try to pinpoint where where you should collect. I definitely have women, maybe um, they have amenorrhea, so no cycle at all for various reasons. Sometimes we just have them collect because they're they're not going, you know, like there's no cycle in the future. Yeah, I just had a patient like that that we we did that. Yeah, you just you're just like you know what, just collect. We we know their estrogen and progesterone is going to be low, but we'll get everything else, which can help. Um, other instances like that. Sometimes I'll say, well, let's try to jumpstart your cycle. Let's try to figure out why your cycle's low and then hormone test afterwards. So if their cycle, if they have amenorrhea because of hypothyroidism or, um, you know, underweight, extreme exercising, you know, whatever various things that might cause it, then um, maybe we'll address those things first and then try to get their cycle back. Your post birth control. All right, let's try to get the brain and the ovary to communicate again and then we'll do testing. Um, but so there's, there's lots of options for women and they can always call the lab. We can help walk them through it. Perfect. That's helpful. Yeah. yeah. So let's kind of get back to the, the test here for a second. I'm, I'm curious, what types of patterns might we see on a Dutch test? So, I mean, we have all these different markers you know, we have our, our cortisol and mm -hmm. our testosterone and the detox pathways or, um, you know, processing pathways for those. And then we have our estrogen and our progesterone and all these different pieces, but like what patterns might we see on the Dutch test for a woman, say, who's either overtly estrogen dominant or mm -hmm. who has higher estrogen relative to progesterone? So we look at, again, we're looking at the dials. And so we're looking to see if it's overt estrogen dominant. So I look at their E1 and E2 and I compare it to their progesterone dial. And I see, um, because it's arrows, I see which arrow is facing higher. So if, if the estrogen arrow is, you know, really high, a lot higher compared to the progesterone arrow, then I know in their luteal phase that they're pretty estrogen dominant at that time and they're not making very good progesterone or maybe not ovulating. Um, and then, so just like you said, it could be sort of a subtle estrogen dominant. So maybe their progesterone is in range, but their estrogen just is higher. So it's estrogen's just sort of winning in which case women are ovulating, they're making progesterone and still they feel PMS or heavy periods or you know, what have you because estrogen is sort of winning on the, on the production scale. And so we can see that visually on the Dutch test, which is really, really nice um, when, it comes to, when it comes to those symptoms and those women. Just like with testosterone, we can see visually if you're going down the pathway that might cause acne and hair growth on your chin and anger and irritation. It's a, it's a, it's a gauge. So if it's leaning this way, then I know that's your cause. And if it's leaning that way, <laughs> then I know that it's not. And so it can be really helpful visually for women to see that. Definitely. And then we were talking earlier before we came on um, to the podcast episode about how you can kind of get an idea of what might be going on with a woman's thyroid. So you can't yeah. test that overtly through urine. You have to mm -mm. do that test through blood. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the patterns on the, on the Dutch test that might indicate to you that a thyroid issue is going on? Yeah. So that's actually more in the cortisol section. So when you have, when, when we think you have a thyroid problem, meaning a slow thyroid problem, um, either overt, hypothyroidism or we call a subclinical. So maybe you're just not making a whole lot of that active T3. Then on the Dutch test, that metabolized cortisol will be really low and your free cortisol will be really high. And the reason for that is when your thyroid slows down, it slows everything down, right? It slows your hair growth down. It slows your digestion down. It slows your metabolism down. 
but it slows down the ability of your liver to metabolize cortisol. So that goes really low because it, it can't get metabolized. And as a result, your free cortisol starts to go up because it can't get metabolized. So it's just coming out as free cortisol. It's, it's not getting metabolized. And so when we see that pattern, low metabolized, higher free, I always say back to the doctor, hey, I think I think this person has a thyroid problem, or if they're on thyroid medication or thyroid supplements, I'm like, I don't think it's working or something is still wrong because it's still showing up in the cortisol results. You might want to work this up more. And I would say there is some research um, definitely with hypothyroidism and metabolized cortisol, but now working at the lab and seeing thousands and thousands of cases, I'd say 70 to 80% of the time I bring this up to a doctor, they're like, oh yeah, they have a thyroid problem. Or, oh yeah, I actually have their thyroid results right here. Yeah. And it, you know, it, things are not great. Or, oh yeah, I just diagnosed them with Hashimoto's. And so it, it's really cool to see. I have, a, I have a question further in that because I have a patient right now who um, she had raging Hashimoto's, like really mm -hmm. high thyroid antibodies, and her TSH was really high. So I've been working with her over the last couple months, getting her back into a TSH range of under 2.5. Mm -hmm. We finally got her there. She's on thyroid. But um, now, she, so she's on a thyroid, a desiccated thyroid where mm -hmm. you get the T4 and a little of the T3. Mm -hmm. And her most recent test was where her T4 was a normal range, but her T3 was really low. Oh yeah. Um, I haven't done the Dutch test with her yet. Uh, so that is probably my next step with her. But I am curious, like, do you have any idea of how maybe cortisol is related? I, I mean, you kind of just explained it, but Maybe so, treatment options for that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, a, that's so right. That's conversion, right? So even though she's on T3, do you have a reverse T3 on her? Is her reverse T3 no. high? So if she, so right, the body will um, often, if it can't convert T4 to T3, then it will turn tail and convert it to reverse T3. Right. And the reasons for that are usually um, protective in nature. So if they have a lot, she has a lot of inflammation, but even high estrogen, high cortisol, um, she's missing certain nutrients, as you know, like selenium or iodine, some of the B vitamins, um, high leptin, leptin resistance will mm. get in the way of, um, there's a really cool uh, paper that talks about that, mm. so get in the way of T4 to T3 conversion. And so it's, um, even though she's on desiccated and she's on T3, it definitely seems like there's some reason, something that her body is saying, no, 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 we need to slow her down. And I, I would yeah. imagine her reverse T3 is probably high or borderline high. Okay. Next so, step. <laughs> yeah. So next yeah. step is figuring out why, why is she not, why is she not making that conversion? Look yeah. at gut health. Yes. Well, gut she's health actually a done a lot of gut health herself. She's, she's amazing at, at doing all the things. And so that's another reason when it came back, I was a little baffled because I was yeah. like, oh man, you're doing all the things. But so I think it is like a cortisol um, issue, a little bit more of inflammation going on somewhere else, or maybe mm -hmm. obviously more gut health needs to be done. So yeah. 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 So what types of things, I mean, if, if you, you do a Dutch test and you find that you have some of these patterns, maybe specifically like for estrogen dominance or, or relative higher estrogen to progesterone or just overtly low progesterone, what kinds of things are we focusing on in diet and lifestyle? We talked about some of the factors that can increase the risk for that or uh, make it harder for us to break down and detoxify our estrogen. But what are some of your like first line of defense? Like what could you just safely tell a woman to go do to <laughs> Um, but, well, um, the number one thing I would say is um, definitely examining diet. So what they're eating and the foods that help estrogen detox the most are like your brassica family, your broccoli, your kale, your cauliflower, your mustard greens, those kind of foods, but really any liver friendly foods, your artichoke, onions, garlic, um, you know, fiber, those things, uh, ground flax seeds will help with estrogen either in the detox pathway we talked about or with estrogen in your GI tract mm -hmm. and um, you know probiotics, prebiotics, all those things actually help estrogen get safely cleared out of the body. Now unfortunately um, you there's a there's a really cool paper where they directly quote like you can't if you have really high estrogen dominance, you can't just eat your way into estrogen, lower estrogen, but right. every little bit is helpful um, in my experience. And so for women who are maybe not eating a lot of those foods, or those are not the vegetables that they like to choose, 
or they don't eat a lot of vegetables in their life, you know, I'm like, okay, it's time that we need to start adding these things in um, because it's going to help your estrogen quite a bit. And then, like I said, the, if your corpus luteum is, are heavy in your carotenes, then eating your, your red vegetables, eating your green, um, your orange vegetables, and even then some, you know, some of your green vegetables, just Google online, foods high in beta carotene, and then you know, eat from those foods and really try to help um, get your corpus luteum to be a whole lot stronger. So those are like my big sort of diety things. Um, mm -hmm. Broccoli sprouts, which women can yes. grow themselves, right? Broccoli sprouts are really high in something called sulforaphane. So in the broccoli sprout itself, there's, there's glu it's fancy, glucoraphanin. And then glucoraphanin, when you, when you chew up the sprout or you chop it up, that action, it activates an enzyme called morosinase. And when they meet, it forms sulforaphane. And sulforaphane is really protective against um, estrogen dominance. It does something, um, there's, there's two SNPs. One is called quinone reductase and one is glutathione sulfur transferase that it works. Quinone reductase is the bigger one. It's very yeah. protective um, for women. Um, and it also upregulates something called NRF2, NRF2, which is a big one for your phase two enzymes, which yeah. is good for neutralization, getting it out. And so um, I tell women, go, you know, either eat organic broccoli sprouts, um, put them in your smoothie, chop them up, cook with them, um, or grow them. I cannot grow them with anything. <laughs> I am not a grower of green things. Yeah, I don't have so, a green thumb. So I don't, yeah, I just take them. <laughs> what because, about environmental exposures? Because we get, yes. we have so much environmental exposure to estrogen and we talked about some of these things earlier, but there are some really heavy hitter exposures that yeah. women just aren't really considering. We talked about this a little bit. I think it was like episode eight of the podcast. We went over like the personal care products. Yeah. Because that's such a huge exposure, but you know, yeah. what types of chemicals are we looking for? What types of things can we just, you know, just dump and yeah, BPA is actually a really big one and it's pretty ubiquitous in our environment. So BPA yeah. and it's like sisters, BPF, BPS, um, it's, it's the stuff in plastics. It's the stuff in the thermal receipts that you get at the store. It's the stuff that lines cans. It's the stuff that lines a lot of like the hot coffee cups and tea cups that you get. Mm -hmm. Um, and what BPA does is it increases that aromatase enzyme. So it increases the testosterone to estrogen conversion and it messes up detoxification. And so I tell men and women, um, both, especially when it comes to fertility, BPA affects sperm production. I mean, it affects so much um, that like switch to glass, switch to stainless steel, don't use, you know, heated plastic anymore. I'm sorry. Don't, you know, when you go get hot coffee or tea, bring your own container, don't use theirs, don't use the lid, don't drink your hot coffee or hot tea with the plastic lid on, take the lid off at least yeah. and drink, you know, and, and then um, just, you know, be very careful. Don't use um, like, like the plastic wrap to microwave food. Uh, God forbid, my, my parents are, live in the South and to this day, my mother still uses saran wrap on everything and I'm like, I'm just not going to, yeah, I just try and it doesn't work. So yeah. <laughs> it's trying. a Southern thing. <laughs> That's so, so interesting. So it's, uh, there's a lot of people who use BPA free plastics. Yes. Like for example, my mother-in-law, she, mm -hmm. uh, was bringing over and like microwaving food in a plastic in my mm -hmm. house. And I was like, no, you shouldn't do that. She's like, but it's, it's BPA, BPA free. free. I know. <laughs> but now we know that what they're doing is they're just substituting it with BPF or BPS, which can be just as bad, but there's not so, as many studies about it yet. And so that's, there. Yeah. So they're, they're, yeah. they kind of, the industry kind of took advantage. They said, oh, there's all this really bad research about BPA. So here, yeah. let's replace it with a chemical that basically does exactly the same thing. Basically. It's yeah. Almost and in some cases, chemically it's identical. Mm -hmm. And we just don't have all the research to say how dangerous it is. So now, yeah. you know, we're getting, but more. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I'm, I'm more of a consumer that tries, you know, even though by now I shouldn't, but trust my, tr I'm more trusting, right? So if it's yeah. Oh, yeah. Free, I'm like, it's hard. This must be good for me. I'm and not trusting. Yeah. I'm like, well. nope, it's plastic. Throw it out. Yep. But I feel like yep. I, a lot of our listeners are trying to do their very best and it's so yeah. overwhelming. Right. And so when they see something that says all natural BPA free, oh, it's safe for me. I'm doing the right things. Right. And uh, boom, you know, right. you realize like, oh, it's actually still really bad for me. So, so I think the big takeaway is use glass, yeah. stainless steel, yep. like just try your hardest not to use plastic yep. at all yep. and just assume that it's all bad. And those things <laughs> last forever. I mean, like really 
it's not that expensive to, it's not very big of an investment to just replace all of your Tupperware with glass or stainless yeah. steel. Like, yeah, and right. it's kind of like a, a one-time thing where, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to destroy that container as quickly as you would a plastic container anyway. So it's kind of a long-term investment. They last forever. You mm -hmm. can find them super easily on like Amazon or Thrive Market is great because they have, you know, some less expensive prices and some yep. great brands on there. So yeah, yeah. they have like silicone Costco. containers. So silicone yeah, yeah. is also another one that's yes. safe, would you say? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Definitely. So that's it. So absolutely. And just like, I, you know, I tell women the same thing you guys did. I, I'm like, look at your personal care products, look at your makeup, look at your face lotion, look at what you use to clean your house. And you know, it's, it's amazing when people read labels, they're like, holy crap, I had no idea. Or just like you said, you're really trusting. It says natural or it says green or the packaging's green and it has little green leaves on it. So you think it's the super safe skincare or body care. And then you turn it over and read the ingredients and you can't pronounce anything. And you're like, oh, it's actually probably not that good for me. It's just slick packaging to make it look natural. Oh, or yeah. just the word fragrance. Like you get, you know, yeah. it's the short list of ingredients and it looks really great until that very last ingredient in there right. is fragrance. And I just did that with a product the other day. I'm like, oh, this is really great. And it had a bunch of essential oil ingredients that were higher up. And then there it was right there at the end, fragrance. Yeah. And that's, you know, yep. we've talked about this on the podcast before, but that can contain hundreds to thousands of different chemicals that are not required to be disclosed on labels because scents are proprietary and companies right. aren't required by law to disclose what's in those scents so that another company couldn't copy their exact right. scent of their product. And, the, and they, they'll say things like, you know, that they just put a, like, oh, it's just a tiny amount and just a little bit, but it's this, it's the same thing like with the dioxin and in, in, in conventional tampons, you know, they're like, right. oh no, it's a safe level. It's a safe level. If you use one, you're fine. I'm like, name a woman that uses one yeah, tampon exactly. <laughs> one in her whole life, like name a woman. And so, you know, most women use when they're, if they're using going the tampon route, then they're using several in a day, you know, maybe they're using one in a day on the, on the light day, but maybe on their heavier day, they're using three to 10 got, you know, I don't know. Oh, and, and then if they're bleeding three to seven days a month, starting when they're a teenager, you know, like you're using a lot of tampons and it's a lot of dioxin exposure that sits right there in your cervical and in, in your um, uh, cervical tissue and your uterine tissue. And so like you've got to, it builds up over time, just like fragrance, right? Use fragrance or any of those chemicals, you rub it on your arms and your body and your lotion, your face. And that, that skin just sucks it right in. And, and we just don't, we just don't understand that yet. Like we don't have all of the data to show us what is kind of the collective toxicity. Right. And how does that create right. this, you know, body burden that we right. deal with over however many years we're using this stuff. I mean, I started using skincare products on my face pretty much like from the moment of puberty when it's uh -huh. like, oh, all of a sudden my skin is doing weird things and I need to wash it and moisturize it. Right. And you know, yeah. put acne treatment on it or whatever. So we, we do girl. this for, we do this <laughs> yeah. for, you know, until we're yeah. 80 basically yeah. from the time yeah. we start puberty. So just understanding and, the, the collective, the synergistic toxicity that might exist, whether we have the data yet to show how dangerous that is or not, we have enough individual studies on individual ingredients mm -hmm. in those products to suggest that they're harmful. Why and would it be less harmful to have them all together? And that's the stuff we can control too. I mean, you know, obviously there's a lot in the world that we can't control, like spraying that happens around us, spraying, you know, on our foods. We can, so then we can choose to eat organic or um, things that happen outside of our house or at our work, or when you walk into the bathroom of someplace and they've got the automatic spray thing up on the wall that's set to go off every 30 seconds for fragrance. And like, we can't control that, but we can control a lot. And so that's what I tell women, just, you know, just slowly start to focus on what you can control. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't freak out. You know, it's, but just slowly start to like, you know what, this plastic container looks busted. I'm going to throw, I'm going to get rid of this one. And then I'm going to buy glass next time. You know what, next time I go into Starbucks and I get myself a coffee, I'm going to either bring my own glass container or I'll at least take the lid off. Like I'm going to use their cup, but take the lid off when I sip it so that I don't sip hot material through a plastic lid. And, you know, just like little bitty changes over time makes a huge difference. I'm going to switch and I'm going to use hundred percent organic tampons. I'm not going to use Tampax that are, you know, sprayed with dioxin and then that's getting absorbed. And so if just these little things are, are helpful, every little bit counts. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. we, we typically encourage people to just go slow and do what uh -huh. you can do. And, and it, it's everybody's individual decision, how fast they want to go. You know, if yeah. you're 
38 and you're trying to have your first baby and you have every exposure under the sun, like maybe you want to go a little bit faster. Maybe that's right. good to you. Maybe that's less stressful than having to deal with the stress of, you know, fertility issues or potentially fertility treatments for somebody who's, you know, 28 and they've got lots of time, you know, maybe they can go a little bit slower. So I would just encourage people to just do what you can do when you can do it. Some of these mm-hmm. things, you know, are a little bit of an investment, like switching out all of your personal care products, right. just one product at a time, you know, exactly. you something and you buy something that's even just a little bit better, you right. know, get rid of kind of the big three in your personal care products. Look for something that does not have parabens, look mm-hmm. for something that does not have phthalates and look for something that does not have synthetic fragrance. Yeah. And there you go. I mean, those are yeah. fairly inexpensive and really easy to find either online or even at grocery stores now. It's and they, pretty- and they work like, like science is caught up with like the whole people worry, Oh, it's not anti-aging enough. It doesn't do that. I'm like, yes, it does. There are amazing companies out there that can be, you know, just because it's green doesn't mean, you know, you can't age gracefully, which I, which is the pushback that I would get from women. I love my skin, my under eye cream. I can't get my under eye cream up. I'm like, I promise there's really good companies out there that are doing it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. a long way from 20, 30 years ago. Well, and a lot of these department store brands are even more expensive than the, yeah. the really good stuff that works right. well that's, that's also clean. Oh, I thought you were going to say a lot of department store brands are actually starting to come out with natural lines, right? Oh, they're that's true, like, they're yeah. getting the pushback themselves from customers. And so I'm seeing a, a little bit more some of these big name brands that are like, all right, here's our natural pure line where, you know, we don't put all the crap in there. <laughs> and maybe eventually so. those will become the main lines for some yeah. of these companies. I think as yeah. women get more educated and, and this information gets out there more, I think we have to just, and maybe this is a little soapboxy of me if it is, I apologize, <laughs> but we have to stop relying on government agencies and other people to protect us. Yeah. You know, we're just at that point where unfortunately, you know, the industries are so big and the oversight just isn't there. And once something is on the market, it's so difficult to get it proven unsafe to the extent that there would be a regulation around it. Right. And, and even then they don't remove it. Usually they just black box yeah. it. So then it's up to you right. to realize that there's a black box warning on it and then, and do something about it. So we just, we just need to be, become more aware. And like I said, you know, this isn't about freaking out and dumping every single thing you own and replacing it all at once, but it's just having a, a shift in mindset that it is your responsibility to protect your body. Right. Yep. I kind of think of it like, you know, having, having my little girl right now, she's 14 months and it's like, what would I put on her skin? What would yeah. I expose her to? You know, like she'll be in the bathroom while I'm getting ready. And I have a hairspray now that I'm, I think is, I think is pretty safe. <laughs> <laughs> it says it's all the, tough. But. It says it's all the freeze, but it still works pretty well. So I'm like, I don't know. Um, and you know, and I always kind of take her out of the bathroom before I spray it on my hair, even though I think it's, Supposed right. To so yeah, like for your own children, would you put this on on their skin? And so, if you wouldn't put on their skin, why why the heck would you put it on your own? Yeah, you know? yeah, so. it's true. It's like the have you guys seen that Febreze commercial where there's a mom and she's going through the house spraying Febreze, and there's a baby in its <laughs> in its high chair, and she literally like yeah. sprays across sprays the baby. The baby. Her, yeah. her her intention is the high chair, like she's and I, but she sprays the kid, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Like nobody uh, sprays really Febreze on the kid. I hope they didn't actually spray it on the baby in the garden. Oh, it was traumatizing to me. Every time I watched it, I'm like, oh my God, they're about to spray the baby. Yep. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Oh so God. I know. Now we need a happier topic to talk about. Yeah. So <laughs> anything else in terms of like actionable things, actionable steps that women can take? I mean, feel free. We always say when we talk about supplements, you know, please see your practitioner. Please yeah. be working with someone before you implement any uh, changes to your supplementation routine. But do you have any supplements in particular that you feel like are really good um, kind of first line for some of these hormonal imbalances? Actually, what I was going to suggest is I know one of the questions you'll probably get is um, when I talked about cortisol and autoimmune, I'm sure people are listening and are like, well, what do I do if my cortisol is flow and flatline? Like, how can I get that up there? And I'll tell you the number one thing you can do is get light exposure in the morning and, and it's right free, easy and cheap, um, free, easy or cheap, depending where you live. So, um, (laughs) right when you wake up in the morning, instead of getting on your phone and checking Instagram, like get up and open your drapes and, you know, get some sunshine in. And if you don't live in a sunny area like me in the Pacific Northwest, then, um, you can buy full spectrum light bulbs and, um, Mm -hmm. there's some really great cheap and easy ones you can get on Amazon. You can buy, um, like, 
like boxes that you put on your desk and, or your dresser or your counter while you're getting ready. Um, or if you, you take it with you to work, I know a number of practitioners that have happy lights or some variation of a full spectrum light bulb at work. You want to make sure it's full spectrum though, because full spectrum mimics the full spectrum of the sun. Right. Um, I was just reading a research article yesterday about, uh, they did a research, they did research on a, on, on a 10,000 lux light and how it suppressed cortisol, it suppressed cortisol awakening response. And I was like, man, a lot of those boxes are five to 10,000 lux. That's I, how could that be? So I'm reading the whole research article and I get to the methods section and it was fluorescent lights. It was 10,000 oh. lux overhead fluorescent lights from GE. And I yeah. was like, I'm sorry, no. you're trying to, you think that a 10,000 lux fluorescent light is the same thing as a full spectrum light bulb or the sun. Like it's, and then if you just Google um, full spectrum versus fluorescent, and then you look at the images, like full spectrum, it's like the rainbow. It's like this really pretty like, wee, and then fluorescent are these spikes. It's like, you get this color, you get this color, and you get this. I mean, it doesn't mimic the sun at all. Wow. I'm like, that's why everyone hates fluorescence. We're all tired. Mm -hmm. It makes our eyes hurt. Like it suppresses our cortisol. And so um, don't use fluorescent lights to get your sun in the morning. <laughs> Either call. use the real sun or buy full spectrum something and turn it on first thing in the morning and get that exposure for, you know, 15, 20 minutes up to an hour, maybe even on bad days. And that will help you retrain your cortisol awakening response that because it's, it's light driven. It's, it's light in the eyes that stimulates that whole response, but it has to be done first thing. You can't like lounge in bed, play on your phone. And then, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes later, get up and decide to open your drapes. I'm so it. guilty of that sometimes. <laughs> oh, me too. That's why I said it. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I do it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's, the, when, so when women are like, wait, what do I do? Get, do that. Or just buy the full spectrum stuff off Amazon. No, if you do full spectrum lights, don't do it at night. So don't put the light bulb in your bedside table unless you promise not to use that bedside table before you go to bed. You want dark, you want dim, you want off your phone at night, off your tablet, off your computer. So it's the opposite. You want the dim, low lux, um, amber color at night um, to retrain up in the morning, down at night, up in the morning, down at night. So that's, and it's- We're starting to try like at least one or two nights a week, like just trying to be in candlelight for the last few oh, hours. Yeah. I love that. Bed. Safe mm -hmm. candles, of course, not the like super gross scented <laughs> ones. But yeah, that's something that we're, that we're trying to implement. We've, you know, kind of unplugged all the lamps and stuff in our room. Mm -hmm. And um, so we'll see how that works out. Yeah. I'm not really a candle person and I'm like, oh, it's fire and it's in the house. And I don't know how I feel about that, but I think it'll be beneficial because you know, we're also addicted to technology. And, mm -hmm. and those of us that work, you know, primarily an online business when we're working at night like duh we're on the computer and on our phones and it's definitely you know something that I'm trying to work on limiting a little bit more but it's hard it's really hard and even if you have those blue light blocking glasses the amber glasses like they definitely work but it's still cheating like you're still on your like I, I have mine you know and I'm like I'm still on my phone I'm still working I'm still like doing things that probably are driving up my cortisol. Like right. I'm not usually reading so a really easygoing book. I'm usually doing work-related stuff or responding to stuff on Instagram or, you know, looking something up that is mentally stimulating when I should be relaxing and bringing my cortisol down. I guess that's the price we pay for trying to get this information out to as many yeah. people as possible. We're just like We're ruining oh. our own health. <laughs> right. It's expensive, right? I, ho I hope your listeners are happy. No, I'm just kidding. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Anything yep. else you want to share before we wrap things up? Any other pieces of advice or, you know, anything else about the Dutch test you think women should know? Um, well, definitely everything on the Dutch website is free for everybody. So if they go to dutchtest.com, they can watch all the videos, all the webinars, see all the blog, all the information. So they can totally nerd out on it. You don't, you don't have to run the Dutch test to get the information on our website. You can just go and, and do the research yourself and and get yourself educated and, and empowered so i highly recommend that yeah oh it's really good yeah. advice absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah and then once you have all that education you'll just be inspired to run the test because once yeah. you have all that, <laughs> don't have that data for yourself you'll be desperate to have it yes. so. exactly yeah. for sure well, Dr. Jones, thank you so much. I actually really enjoyed this interview. Oh, I learned good. so many things myself. So that was really fun. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So um, tell us, so 
we actually offer the Dutch test on our website, um, but can they go direct to Dutch and also get the test themselves? Too, they can go work? learn on the, they can go learn about the test on the website. We much prefer though that they order through like you guys, like the yeah. practitioners, because um, otherwise you now have the test and then what do you do with it? So we'd way prefer they go through you, like you, and then you'll walk them through what to do and, and yeah. how it to interpret be it. kind of complicated. <laughs> it can be. It's a lot of information and people, women get very excited, understandably, but then they get it and they're like, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not in medicine. Yeah. I don't know how to what read. What are all these dials? I know. I know. <laughs> oh, and the pathways and all that stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. if you do not have prior experience looking at that stuff, it's a little like when I, the first one of mine that I looked at, mm -hmm. I didn't really know anything about the Dutch test. And I was like, oh my God, my eyes are crossed. Yeah. And yeah. like, yeah. yeah. It can be a lot. So definitely go off your website <laughs> and they can get your help. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Well, thank you so very much again for this interview and um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks ladies. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. That's going to wrap things up for this week. We hope you enjoyed the interview. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Dr. Carrie Jones is great. We're so happy that she was able to come on and share this information about functional hormone testing and the Dutch test. So if you were inspired by what you heard today, we do want to let you know that you have the opportunity to take your own Dutch test. And we have this test available on our website for you to purchase with a consultation with us to interpret your results. And like we mentioned, this is kind of our favorite tool for assessing hormone health health and fertility in our practice. So we highly encourage you to consider making this a part of your preconception or fertility journey. Yes. And then if you're wanting to get a better idea, if you're actually dealing with hormonal imbalances, we do have a free quiz that you can get. It's called, are you healthy enough to get pregnant? So it's going to go over the five categories that, um, of symptoms that could give you an idea if you are dealing with hormonal imbalances and then which category you need to focus on um, on your fertility journey. So in the quiz, in the download, it will also give you actionable steps that you can start implementing right away. So it could be really helpful and we highly encourage you to get that quiz. And the way you can get it is just going to our website at tinyfeet.co, that's T-I-N-Y-F-E-E-T dot C-O. And then it's just right there on the front page. You'll see our uh, lovely faces smiling back at you. And there is a button that says, take the free quiz right there on the front page. So we encourage you to get that. And then also please follow us on Instagram where we are active there every day, putting up stories and new uh, tidbits um, all about fertility and helping you get pregnant faster and have a healthy baby. And we are at tinyfeet.co at Instagram. And uh, next week, we are going to be interviewing Dr. Jolene Brighton. Yep, we're so very we're excited for that interview. She's going to talk about her book, Beyond the Pill, which came out recently. And she is going to give us some incredible information about why it's so important to be focusing on hormone balance after birth control. So we can't wait to see you back next week. All right. Bye. Have a great week.